Good morning, Iowa Church of God. I greet you all the way from South Africa. As we are still on our mission, as I explained to you before we left, we had to come on this mission, very important mission. Well, greetings from my family to yours. We really miss everybody. And if you're watching this online or in service, I want to thank you for being part of this ministry. And may the Lord bless you and may He keep you. Now today we're going to speak on keep your pace in the race. And if you want to keep your pace in the race, your eyes should be on the prize. Because if your eyes is not on the prize, but you lose your focus, you're obviously not keep the pace and you'll lose pace. But before we get to the service this morning, I want to thank everybody for their contributions towards this ministry at Highway Church of God, as well as other international missions and, and so on. We want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your support towards this congregation and its missions. Now, I would like to tell you this. It matters what and how you give. It, it does matter what and how you give. It matters so much that Jesus once sat himself down inside of the temple, you know, close to the offering casket, if you will, and made some very, very important remarks about our giving. It's not so much as how much we give, but the heart in how we give. So, the Bible teaches in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, So let us, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So, may God bless you in your giving also today, and we want to thank you from our hearts that you're still able to do so. We're going to include a special prayer in, in our opening prayer after I read the Bible. And we're going to pray also about the offering this morning in that prayer. But before we do that, if you will just stand with me this morning so that we can, we can read the Word of God, I would really appreciate that. Um, then um, we'll find and we'll turn a page to 1 Timothy 4. Let me just turn there real quick. 1 Timothy 4. If you will, you can just follow. Excuse me, it's 2 Timothy 4, 4. You can just follow with me. And we read a couple of verses in, in the Word of God there. From verses 1 to 18. It's quite a number of verses, so bear with me. Now the Bible teaches, preach the Word solemnly. Charge you in the presence of God, of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove. Rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Have you seen this before? Yes, I've seen it so many times. And will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Make every effort to come to me soon. For them us, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Christians has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, only and Moray to South Africa. <laughs> only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with me, with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus, I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Trowers, with Corpus and the books, especially the parchments. Already, excuse me, Alexander, the, the coppersmith, did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him, him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against him. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished. 
and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? To hear such an encouraging word from the Lord today. That, you know, we, we are partakers of his kingdom and of his heavenly things. We are, we are one of a kind. God loves us. God God. Loves us so much that He gave Himself to us. Let us pray a blessing over this word this morning. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we want to thank You for the reading from the book of life this morning. As we have read from 2 Timothy 4. And I pray, O oh God, that You will use me as an instrument today in people's lives. Father God, that You self will do the cutting. And Lord, that this won't be a judgmental message at all, but that it will be an encouraging message to some. For some it will be judgment, but for others it will be encouragement. My prayer is to God that you will bless our hearts as we receive, and we are about to receive from the hand of God in the name of Jesus. We also want to appreciate God, every person that has come to this ministry financially and who has blessed this ministry financially. And we want to thank you, Father God, for these people. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you will open up the heavens over their lives and that they will experience the joy of God like never before. I thank you, Lord, for a blessing upon their lives and upon their finances. And I ask, Lord, that you will cancel their debts in the name of Jesus, that you will touch their bodies with good health, that you will support their ministries, that you will support their lives, wherever they walk, wherever they go, that they will find that God is already there in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you that you will bless us with your, with your grace and with your kindness and that we can experience the overwhelming joy that is only in Jesus. Amen. Yes, absolutely. The, the joy of God is only in Jesus. Now, I would like to tell you a little story before I start off with this sermon this morning. And it's a, bit, it's a story that Sylvester Ferguson tells and, um, in 2009. Now, James was excited as he turned the 200 mark heading towards home. Two and three quarter laps had gone, and he was still in the lead. Now, he, he's won, and only only goal was to win this race, and he was full of confidence that he could do it. His thoughts raised ahead to the podium, the applause, the glory, and his body revealed, you know, revealed in the great feeling uh, which is produced because of all of that. He had started the last lap with a great lead. He had no reason to worry at all. His legs had a rhythm to them, and it was okay. Be behind him, just behind him, Antonio had a different thought about this. He had realized that James was confident, too confident. He was sure he could pass. He could, could pass him, and he planned to make his move at the 100 uh, meter mark. In the end, he had reduced the distance between him and James, and he knew that he had plenty reserved left, and he. He could win this race. Now, as they uh, turned towards the home stretch, James heard the crowd beginning to get excited. He was bathing um, in the glory, but then he realized that they were cheering for someone else. He heard the footsteps and his body felt a tremor of fear. He feared, you know, if he heard the breathing and his brain sent an urgent message to his legs, but his legs reported, and said, sorry, we cannot do it. His nose picked up the faint smell of perspiration as Antonio took him out. His eyes realized the fears which, which they were holding for a situation like this. His mind reeled from this realization that the dream he had created would never be fulfilled. Antonio passed the finish line and James followed, but the crowd was still cheering and celebrating at that stage. There was pandemonium in the stands. It was only then that they, these two people, realized that the applause and the cheers were not for them, but for those who were behind them. Those who had sacrificed the idea of winning to help each other, you know, reach the finish line also. During this race, many, many had given up and walked off the track. But Peter, though he had pulled the hamstring, did not. He now came in limping in the last few 
uh, 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 meters being supported by his rival Al Alfonso. Alfonso had decided to un understand that it is not just to finish the race, but it is also important to realize what race you are running. Some races are far more important than others. And the way to win the eternal race is to help someone get there. And my encouragement for you in this morning is that we would help somebody out there to also be part of this race and also to win something of this race. You know, because we're all in this race, but the race is not against one another. It's against yourself. You need to find yourself a good place where as you can win this race against yourself. Many people run and run and they, they just get so tired of all the running. They, because that race never actually stops in this life. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and he said the following words to young Timothy about, you know, his mission in the world. He said the following and he said, I have fought. Some people thought, listen now, some people, they, won't, they will not, you know, uh, only fight the good fight. They will think about the good fight. You can maybe think about this for a bit. Some will, some will fight, some will fought the good fight, and other, others will thought the good fight. But in Paul's case, I have thought, I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Hallelujah. This is 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, or 7, excuse me. But before this, he writes this very important statement, and he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now, it worries me to think that the time of your departure might, might be at hand. So, therefore, we need to be ready at all times, at all costs. Paul felt that he was in the airport of his flight to heaven. Because his flight to heaven was already booked. You know, and it was ready to depart. He waited for his boarding call at that stage in his life. Paul's exhortation to Timothy is, therefore, even more meaningful because he knew he was passing from the one scene, and Timothy must carry the cloak on the other scene, or to the next, or he need to take the baton, or he need to take the torch. Now, God's workmen pass on, but God's work continues, even if we're not here, even if I'm not there, God's work will always continue, even if I leave this, this place, you know, God's work will keep going. Now, I want to discuss a few things with you this morning, and to keep your pace in the race, of course, and that's, you need to run in anticipation. You need to run in adoration. You need to run in absolution. But also you need to run in association. It would help if you weren't only a pace setter, but also a pace maker. Some people will always, you know, be a, a pace setter. They would run the race with, with, with a lot of pace. But soon enough, they will just fall out like the pace setter. God has entrusted you with so much to bless you with and many, many strengths to occupy the land in a good place. God has instructed every person listening to my voice to occupy the promised land, to occupy what you need to occupy. The saying goes, hasty dog burns his mouth. But you will lose your chances if you do not push this through. The race you're running right now to inherit the promise isn't against other people, other bodies. But it's about your body. It's about, it's, it's about you. It's against yourself. We are our own greatest and fiercest enemies on the field. Yes, we are. We are our own greatest enemies. Not the one opposite of you or sitting next to you inside of church. It's you. You are your greatest enemy. When we run with anticipation, the Bible teaches about a story. Let, let me tell you the story in the book of Acts 3. What happens there? Let me just give you some back, backdrop. Now, as you know, that the apostles back in the day, they went to the temple every, every Saturday. They went to worship on the Sabbath. They, they attended their church, if I may. They attended their church. And it was important for them to be there because it's right there where they can make a difference. And, and if they can make a difference in, you know, in that cultural, diverse community, this cultural, diverse community can now go out and do their thing in the world. Now, what happened in their discourse, what happened was they were walking towards the temple door and they saw this person begging from them. 
he was just a beggar, but he was a lame beggar. Some people are, you know, some Christians are lame Christians. They really are lame. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what happened here was that as soon as they heard this beggar, as they passed by, because this beggar, I mean, he, had, he may have lost all hope. But the Bible says in the book of Acts 3, verse 4 and 5, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Now, I mean, this must, this must tell you something, saying, this must tell you something, that, that there's people that we, will be looking at you. They will be looking. The, the, word, the, the, the scripture continues, so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But he did receive something from them. But he didn't receive what he expected, anticipated. He didn't run with anticipation for the best reasons. He ran for his own reasons. A young student once asked the discoverer of the anesthetic prop, um, property of chloroform, Sir James Simpson, what he considered his greatest discovery at the time. The man of science and the man of God answered this, he said, the greatest discovery I ever made was when I discovered that I was a great sinner and that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Anticipation, my friend, is getting ready for what God has told you is coming. That's what anticipation is all about. But for this lame beggar, it wasn't about that. It wasn't about that. He was looking for something else. He was looking for some other answer, anticipation. Anticipation on the step of the temple when Peter and John approached this temple, the temple. You know, the beggar anticipated so, for some money. And he wanted something from them. He didn't anticipate to get, you know, the ability to walk. They gave him more than he asked. And this is what God will do for us. He will give us more than what we ask for. Nothing will come your way when you expect nothing. Let me tell you that. So don't act surprised when nothing happens. I want to state this again in church. I want to make the statement very clear to you. Nothing will come your way when you expect nothing. So don't act surprised when nothing happens. Some expect the worst and the worst would come. And after they'll say something like, I told you so. Yes, we are all, we are all guilty of that. I told you so. We'll all say something like that for our children and people close to us. I told you so. I'm never surprised that good things happened to me because God made me a promise sense that goodness and mercy would follow me all the days of my life. And the same promise he made to me, he made to you. God promised and he surely will deliver on all of his promises and all of his commitments. Will say yea and amen. Yes, God will do what he said he'll do. No way that God wouldn't do exactly as he said he's going to do. And in the same sense, we are anticipating the return of the Messiah. In the same sense as this lame beggar, we've, we've become lame in our, in our worship of the king. So, uh, you know, so they gave this man more than they, uh, you know, than he got expected. He expected a little bit of money, but they gave him life. Money cannot buy your legs, let me tell you that. Money cannot buy your peace. Money cannot even buy your happiness. This beggar was a was a sad individual that was just sitting there for years and years. There's many sad individuals in our churches, in our marketplace, in your office, that's just sitting there for years and years. And you think a little bit of money would do the thing. It will do nothing. It will do nothing. He never thought for the life of him that such a miracle would take place in front of his, his spot, on his spot there in front of the temple. But there was something you were supposed to do. And there's something you need to understand, saying, there's something you're supposed to do when God instructs you, you need to comply. They said to him, pick up your bed and go. And he did so. So he did something. He had to pick up his bed in faith. Now the original meaning of the word anticipation comes from the Latin word anticipation, which is based on on, on, on derived feeling of expectation, but on action and preparation. Now, we need to be filled with action. We need to have plans, but we cannot have plans without the blessing. We'll have to, need, we, we'll have to put our faith into practice, you know, having action and preparation also. For example, Noah, when he got instructed by God to build an ark, 
He didn't wait for 40 years and fasted for 40 years to be sure if it's God that speak to him. He started to build the ark. He set up some blueprints and he said, oh God, is this fine? He started to build the ark immediately because God gave him a warning and he needed to have action as well as preparation for what was coming. He knew that rain was coming, a flood would be coming to earth, and he had to take some action and preparation for what God said he needed to do. Now, I mean, it was the same situation when he was instructed by God to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he did so. He packed up everything he had. And he went back to Jerusalem to his own town, and he started to erect those walls. God gave him the instruction. He had action and preparation. He instructed the soldiers to build with the one hand and keep the sword or the spear in the other hand. To be prepared. Well, let me say, expecting the best, preparing yourself for the worst. Now, the second point I want to stress today is run with adoration. We have to run with adoration. Let me go to the book of Psalms 34, verse 1 and 4. To form. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make it boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Sought the Lord. I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. That's Psalms 34 verses 1 to 4. So God heard his cries. God heard of all his fears, because he gave it to God. He said that God would take care of all of his fears. A man in one of Dion Moody's meetings once testified that he had lived on the Mount of Transfiguration if you, for five years. He said he lived there for five years. If you know them, the Mount of Transfiguration is where Jesus transfigured and, and, and his apostles or his disciples said, Lord, let's build three huts here. One for you, one for Elijah and for Moses. Let's, let's build this here for you guys. That's the Mount of Transfiguration. We always take the people we, we, we take to Israel to pass the mountain. We, we never go up there. It's, it's our mountain. You'll take some, it will take some time out of our schedule to get up there. But this guy, he stayed there for five years. Now, Dion Moody asked him this question. How many souls did you lead to Christ last year, sir? Moody bluntly asked him, well, the man hesitated, hesitated and he said the following. I don't know, sir. He, Moody asked him, have you saved any? Have you saved any, he persisted. And the guy said, I don't know that I have, the man admitted. Well, said Moody, we don't want that kind of mountaintop experience. When a man gets up so high that he cannot reach down and save poor sinners, there is something wrong. There is something wrong when we get up so high to think whether we are so high and mighty that we are too good to get down there to save the, the wrongs of people, to help people to realize their wrongs. But we have to run with adoration. We have to run whilst worshiping the king. Many people that forget to worship the king in their race because they get tired. Evelyn Unreal said, Adoration is caring for God above all else. So, so no matter what happens, I want to, I want to say that you're also... Adoration is care for God above everything in your life. That's what adoration is all about, to give care for Him. Giving yourself, in other words. Giving yourself and giving your everything. To run in adoration means you pray and worship whilst you're running the race. Some of you and I become so tired of the race that we miss the whole point, and that is our, our adoration whilst we're running. This isn't my race, but yours maybe. And we all have a race to compete in and, you know, in an hour season. When it rains, the wind blows, the earth shakes, the race will keep going. You have to keep up with yourself in this race and worship the Lord whilst running this race. You cannot, cannot run it alone. Maybe sometimes you'll feel alone, but you should run with somebody. Never underestimate the will of man. Never underestimate your own will when it comes to pushing through in this race. If you are a strong believer and a faithful giver, God will surely aid you in your race. He will help you. He'll give you water on your race. He'll be your best supporter in your race. 
you give of your time, give of yourself and your resources, he will be there on your side to sustain you and maintain you on this way. He will be a runner with you with everything you need to, to make it. He will take everything you need on this way. He will even do more than that. He will pick you up when you slip and slide. He will help you and he will carry you on the way. When you need some pushing, he'll do that. He'll do whatever it needs to be done. Now, most verses of the New Testament do not use the word adoration in re reference to our worship of God. But it's translated from the Greek word and it says proskinio as worship. Proskinio means to bow before or to revere. The root word means to kiss. To the idea of proskinio is to kiss the ground in reverence before someone. Now this is the kind of worship we do for our king and our Messiah. That's what the, 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 the early saints did when Jesus came into Jerusalem. They, they worshipped the ground he walked on. When the wise men arrived in Jerusalem and in, inquired as to the whereabouts of the newborn king, they said to Herod, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship with him. Or worship him, excuse me. That's Matthew 2 verse 2. You can find it there. The word translated worship in that, in that verse is the word proskunio, which communicates an adoration and reverence for the Son of God. Now, the refrain, and you all know the song, when we sing in Christmas time, Oh, come, all you faithful. It also enjoys, you know, follow the example of these wise men with the threefold, you know, interation when it says, Oh, come, let us adore him. Come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Cry, haste the Lord. You know, the song, it's our adoration towards the king. The word, the word in the Old Testament over here, that most often refers to adoration is the Hebrew word of shacha, which is also translated as worship. To, um, worship. Such adoration is forbidden to offer to idols, of course. You can read about that in the book of Psalms 97 verse 7, as well as Leviticus 26 verse 1 on your own time. God is a jealous God, according to Exodus 20 verse 5 and Deuteronomy 4 verse 24. As a loving husband, he's jealous of his bride's affections towards other men. The Lord made us for himself and desires that all our worshipful adoration be saved from, for him alone. It's not shareable. Jesus said that the Father is looking for those who will adore him, and we were designed to do so. Jesus said that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Excuse me. I'm running the race. Just going to go to the correct verse again. That true worship will come, you know, and, and, and we need to worship Him in, in truth. Adoration differs from praise, although the two are related. They are like family. Adoration or worship should be reserved for both, for God alone, according to Luke 4 verse 8, when it says, And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Isn't that beautiful? Adoration differs. Praise can be a part of adoration, but adoration goes beyond praise. It goes further than praise. Adoration gets to the heart of who we are. Through worship, people truly worship God. We must let go of our self-worship. We must leave the self behind. That's why Jesus said, you, when you want to follow me, you should deny yourself. Pick up your cross and then follow me. We must be willing to humble ourselves before God, surrender every part of our lives to His control, and adore Him for who He is, not what He has done. Because there's many people that will adore the Lord for, for what He's done, and not for who He is. And we're not that kind of people. Give yourself today, saints. Give yourselves, give your heart, give of your time. I want to also say that we need to run with absolution. Absolution, excuse me. Now this absolution I'm talking about isn't the absolution or sacramental act of the priest or the Catholic priest. You know, the Catholic priest doesn't forgive sin. It's impossible, but he does. He absolves sin 
in the name of Jesus, they say. The absolution we need isn't confirmation of forgiveness from another fallen human being, but from Christ alone. This is the absolution we have. The absolution that Christ sets us free. You're, you're free as far as yourself to run the race without judging yourself in the process of your failures. You may fail, but pick yourself up again because Jesus is right there by your side. Failures are allowed. You're allowed to fall. You're allowed to pick yourself up again. But stay focused. Run with absolution. And remember that Christ is the one that forgives. He's the one who sets you free. Who the Son sets free will be free indeed. This is the word of God in John 8 verse 36. When Jesus comes to the, you know, and speaks about that, he wants to speak about our freedom. We love to be free, of course. We love to be free from debt, free from guilt, free from everything. Our freedom isn't something we buy, but something we pay for. Did you hear the saying? Your freedom isn't something you can buy, but something you pay for. You have to give something for your freedom. You have to submit yourself. You have to deny yourself some certain things to be free indeed. Because Christ will set you free if you're willing to pay the price. Not a price of money, a price of you. You. Give yourself. Our freedom isn't something we buy, people. The only reason, or the only re excuse me, someone once said, the only real per uh, prison is fear. And the only real freedom is freedom from fear. I guess this is something we want today. If I want to ask some individuals in this congregation this morning, what do you want? You want freedom from fear. This is what we really want. Because many of us, we are still stuck in the prison of fear. We are still stuck and we are still chained up by our past. Because we are frightened that our past will haunt us. And even be it so, if you are frightened about that, your past is really haunting you. Your past is really following you. But who the sun sits free is free indeed. Would you not just stand up maybe or sit down and praise the Lord? Because you are really free. You are free from any fear. The world creates fear to destroy our absolution in the race. We cannot run with absolution if we have this fear of the enemy behind us. Remember, God is with you. The, the Lord of heaven and earth is with you. And greater is he that is in you than he is that's, that's in the world. Peter Marshall said the following, May we think of freedom not as the right to do as we please, but as the opportunity to do what is right. Now, we do not see this in the world anymore because they do not see freedom anymore as doing what's right, an opportunity to do what's right, but to do evil. They want to, to be free to do any evil, to say anything, to please them. But we are Christians. We are saints. We are the holy ones of God. We shouldn't do what we want to do. We should do what God wants us to do. And free people operate from freedom. You cannot operate from bondage, from the past, or the things that haunt you, or the things that drive you up against the walls, but you need to operate from your freedom. Yes, from your freedom. The last point I want to make tonight, or today, is, this morning, is run with association. Since you need to run with associa association, we need association. You may hide your real agenda in anything, but sooner or later, it won't just stay under the carpet. It will pop out. It will pop out when you expect it least. It will just come, poof, when you don't see it coming. Association with all the wrong people will corrupt your character also, especially when you have no character. Did you hear that? It will corrupt everything in your life, especially when you don't have any character. People, Some people have two agendas. And these two agendas will always confuse you and give you some trouble. Therefore, we need to run in with as association. We're not lone runners. And even when you say you're in a, a non-denominational church, that's fine with me. But, but you're still, you know, associated with the body of believers. You're still part of the church. There's only one body. Only one body. The Word of God says in 1 Corinthians 15.33, and I want to really rush this now. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Listen to what Paul says to the church. Saints, he's coming to you and I today also and say, listen, you guys, 
Stop for a moment and smell the roses. You shouldn't be deceived. Because sometimes smells will deceive you. Hmm. The, the, you know, the proof is in the pudding, or the, in the tasting of the pudding, of course. The pudding can smell nice, but as soon as you put your lips on that, something is wrong with this. Something is wrong with this. And this is what evil company is all about. They will give you the nice smells, and they will draw you in, they will lure you in, and, and as soon as you, you know, realize, you cannot realize this soon enough, but then it corrupts all your good habits. It corrupts you as a saint, as a God-fearing person. Because evil company will always corrupt good habits. That's what it does. When you run with others in association, in other words, run with association, when you run with others and not against others, you're probably, you're probably a team of runners. Yes, you are a team of runners. We run against evil in this world. Why have it been so difficult in the church world to discover the secret that runners can help one another on the, on the way? As humans, we are very resourceful and should also be respectful of other runners because we really don't know what others are going through who meets us on the field. We don't know what they're facing. We do not know what they're giants. What we don't know about a person is sometimes more important than the things we know. What you don't know about this person would be important. Now, yes, it will be difficult to pull a person behind you. Yes, it will be difficult to pull any person behind you. At first, it will feel like nothing. But the longer you pull this person, the slower you will go. And you will get tired. Sometimes you'll have to let go. That God can have his wonderful way. Sometimes we try to pull people and pull people and push people in the best direction. But sometimes you'll have to let go that God have his wonderful way with this individual. Sometimes the streams of life will take a person to another place where you'll get in touch with God again. Proverbs 9, 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Now, <laughs> this is, it sounds like a promise. I promise you, you, he who walks with wise men will be wise. Come on. It sounds like a commitment. If you want to be wise, yes, walk with wise people. If you want to be destroyed, walk with fools. People that doesn't fear the Lord and doesn't fear His commands. I want to come to a close today. and um, You know, I like speaking in kind of acronyms. and Jesus loved parables. Uh, I also love parables to read those and use those in my sermons. But I also love um, acronyms. Now, the last point I want to stretch today in closing is run. Run the race, my friend. If you could run this race and commit yourself to this race, and God will do the race. You have to run in anticipation. You have to run in adoration. You'll have to run in absolution and also run in association. And remember what I said earlier. It would help if you weren't only a pace setter, but a change maker. Can you be a change maker maybe for God? And if I should reflect and go back two steps, that just to get a better scope of what's going on, I'm still running, but I'm also reflecting. Also running can unite us. If we all run in the same direction, and, you know, <laughs> the leader of the pack is on the wrong direction, of course, he will lay us, lead us all astray. But we need to unite and form a unity when we run. Because when you are, we are a unity, the enemy would, would not know who to attack. That's what sheep do. When, when the wolf comes closer, the sheep would... All come also closer into the, you know, into the pack, and they they will and they will just push their heads towards each other, so that the wolf will be surprised when he gets there because the sheep is in unity. And in the same way, the church needs to be in unity. We as children of God needs to find reflection, and we need to unite against the devil's works. We need to unite. You know, I mean, we can all do different things. It's fine. We can do that. But if we put our strengths together, we can do amazing things together. Isn't that awesome? The last point is we have to nurse one another. Sometimes people need nursing. 
Sometimes people need a little bit of nursing or just to get that hand to pick them up when they trip and fall in, in their race. Everybody will get some pains. Everybody will get have a weakness in their race. But they, they're at that stage. They just need nursing. Maybe you are in that position today. Maybe you need nursing. You can get, give this to the saints in the sanctuary this morning that we pray about that. And that God will really come through for you. Because God wants to come through for you. He wants to bless you, but you need to run with perseverance. You need to run the race. And as you run, just take in consideration and reflect about the Word of God. And also unite your mind with the, with the assembly, with the assembly of the saints. I, I, yes, of course I would say the assembly with our church of God, but we are part of a bigger body. And unite your mind with them. And also, nurse one another. Care for one another. If you will, let's pray this morning for all. For each and every one in this sanctuary. And let's pray for a blessing upon us and upon our families in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we glorify you in this day. Because you, O oh God, you are the one who we are running for and not running from. We, we, do not, we choose also not to run from the enemy. Because we are not scared. We are not afraid because you are around us. You are in us, and you who are in us is greater than the one is you. That's the one is in the world. We praise you, O oh God, for your for your presence in our lives. We want to thank you for helping us on our race. Sometimes this race will be uphill, other times it will be downhill. We do not want to spend too much time on the mountains of this world, as the Almudi said, but we want to come down to worship with others, to worship the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. We want to adore you this morning, O oh God. We want to praise and sing your praises with the saints in the name of Jesus. Because you are God. You are the beginning. And you are the end. Thank you for destroying all forms of fear in our minds and our hearts. Every form of, of desolation in our hearts. Lord, destroy that in the name of Jesus. So that we will be focused on the more important things. And that is winning souls. I pray, O oh God, that you will bless us as we go out of this place today to win souls, to tell people about the love of Christ Jesus. Maybe, Lord, there's somebody listening to my voice right now. And they've been, they've been dreaming of giving their lives to Jesus. They've been wanting to give their lives to Jesus, but they are frightened of what will happen after. I pray, O oh God, that they will just experience your peace right now. In the name of Jesus. I want to ask you, Lord God, that you will that you will lead those people closer to you in this day, in Jesus' name. Maybe you're sitting there right now, and you're thinking to yourself, self, it's time. It's time for absolution. It's time to run the race with absolution. It's time to pick up yourself and stand up for Christ in the name of Jesus, because he's the only one that can forgive us. Thank you, Jesus, that you forgive us. If you're that one, would you just raise your hand right now? Just ask the Lord into your life in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to do you a prayer and you're going to follow. I want you to pray right now and ask the Lord Jesus into your life. Make a commitment and say, oh Lord, I want you. I need you. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe there's somebody else that just needs a prayer of encouragement. I pray, O oh God, that you will encourage our hearts, that we will run this race, but that, and that we will all finish well because of your grace. Thank you, Jesus, that we can adore you in this day for giving us victory. Thank you that we can, that we can form unity today against the works of the devil, and that we can destroy every wicked plan in Jesus' name. I also pray for those who are ill, Lord, that you will heal them today in the name of Jesus. And those who need comfort, that you will also comfort them in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. Thank you that you will never depart on us. That you will never bail on us like many others would bail on us. Turn their backs on us, but you will never. And we want to thank you for that in Jesus' name. 
I speak a special blessing out in the name of Jesus Christ, our Messiah and King. Amen. Well, thank you, Church of God. May you be blessed. May you be encouraged. And when you go into this week, tell somebody, not about me or about my family, but tell somebody about Jesus and what He's done for you. About what He's done and caused, in, caused into your life and brought into your life. And that is a life not filled with fear, but a life. A life of freedom in Christ Jesus. May you be blessed. And thank you for being here today. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful movement of God. Shalom. I greet you in the precious name of Jesus. All our love. Amen.